You run down on your feature events, 25 laps. On the pole is car number 98, Bud Finale of Jamestown, New York, a 1957 Chevy. Pole car number 220, Chuck Piazza of Jamestown, New York, a 1956 Chevy. Next on the pole, car number one, Marv Thorpe of Sugar Girl, PA, a 1956 Ford. Next on the pole, car number 68, Jim Scott of Grand Valley, PA. Off the pole, car number 16, Kenny Johnson of Jamestown, New York, a 1957 Chevy. Next on the pole, car number 30, Dean Mayfield of Wellsville, New York, a 1957 Supercharged Ford. Next on the pole, car number 8, Emory Mann of Warren, PA, a 1957 Chevy. Next off the pole, car number 27L, Sammy Lamacuso of Jamestown, New York. Off the pole, car number M1, Bobby Snires of Bustide, New York. 25 laps to go. 25 laps, your starter Jim Ponder looks them over, and they're off. Started hot riding a neighbor's tractor off in the lower <laughs> down there on the farm. <laughs> Somebody you looked up to, Bobby, uh, as, as the racing was becoming more popular? Just down the street here, Donnie Linneman lived down there. And they built a, a old modified for uh, John Seeley to drive. It was a 37 Plymouth with a Chrysler Hemi head engine in it. <laughs> So I kind of, you know, followed John too. I, I was just a kid then. I hadn't started to drive a car yet. I hung around there on my bicycle to get in the way when they was building that car. So I got interested, you know, right there, early on. I guess I don't know. I had an old field car at home that I had all stripped out and, you know, gave my mother gray hairs for speeding around the, the kind of track out in the field out there. And I uh, had another old field car that my cousin David at Anderson and uh, Ralph Bodka, they come up and was driving that, and they rolled it over out there in the field, and my mother clamped down on her driving them. <laughs> Is your dad interested in this stuff at all? No, no, he never. What did he do for a living? He was a carpenter. Carpenter? So handy with his hands and... Yeah. And... I don't know, I had a grandfather who lived across the road here now. This was before my time. I, you know, I know my grandfather, but I guess he sold cars, uh, used cars and stuff back in the, oh gosh, early 30s or somewhere around in there, years and years ago. So maybe some of that, you know, <laughs> interest <laughs> originated there. In 1955, maybe I drove my first race at a, a uh, racetrack down outside of Kane called Highland Speedway. And I think only, I'm not sure if I raced there more than once, but I did at least once, I know. Mm -hmm. I uh, I didn't finish last. I passed the one guy to get out of last place. <laughs> 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 I fought like Elda. <laughs> <laughs> I was a no instant success. You yeah, know? Yeah. <laughs> We, uh, I didn't really have much to do with building this first car, but I hung around there all the time with the guys. And, uh, well, you know, during the week, I'd think I'd probably won the race, and then I'd get there at the racetrack, I wasn't quite pushing it, so. But the guy that was driving, he decided he didn't want to, or was going to let me drive, so I didn't get a start in the heat race. I started in the feature, the very first first one I started in, and if I remember right, I was like about third or fourth back on the inside of the of the starting lineup, you know. So we come around and geez, it was roaring there, the, the cars was making my car vibrate even. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'm not going to, you know, dive right into that first corner wildly and spin out or anything. I'm going to take it 
a little bit cautious going in there. Well, there was somebody behind me that was ready to go. <laughs> they gave me a boot in there. I went out and hit the guy that was on the outside of me, and I dove to the inside, and by that time there was a couple more <laughs> coming through in there. <laughs> and uh, by the time we got to the end of the back stretch, I was last. <laughs> I had to fight back. What does Bill Sperry mean to you? Well, he owned that first car that uh, they put together. He bought a, it had a 270 GMC truck engine in it that uh, came out of a guy's car here from Busti, Ralph Botka was his name. And that has, was built up for him, I think, by, uh, was a guy who lived over to Sugar Grove, maybe. I don't know if anybody knows him. Ed, Ed Peterson was a small guy. He worked on trucks and stuff, and uh, so that's where the motor come from. Bill bought the bought the motor, and uh, another fellow, Glenn Coons, <laughs> uh, built the car. So Bill just drove it a little bit. We took that car and took the engine out, and we took it down to Ralph Sanquist, and he painted it up for us, and we called it M1. That was I'm going to come up with that number. I remember had a big M1. I think it was red, and we had a big gold bullet going through the car on both sides and, and uh, why M1? because we named it after the rifle, the M1 rifle okay. that, was, that was pretty popular back then days so. how did he connect with you? did you know him, a family friend? well we all hung out down here at the gas station and mm -hmm. bust I really was uh, you know the, we probably schemed up a lot of things <laughs> <down there. laughs> you know I ran on the road, I didn't do all of my racing at the speedway either <laughs> In the early years, <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> there wasn't that many, many cars on the road, you know. And uh, Ralph Botka had this old Pontiac convertible with a with a truck engine in it. And Quentin Lane had a, a '50 Oldsmobile it had dual carburetors on it. I believe that was a standard shift car, but they had kind of a rivalry there from the gas station because. Uh, the uh, Archie Lane run the gas station then, and I don't know, they got it. I up they was going to have a big drag race there for the championship, and and uh, Ted Berry was a town constable. The Willis and Matoon, I think, was the, the policeman, but Ted was a constable, and he was a meat cutter there at the store right in the middle of Bust Eye, so he flagged them off right in the middle of <laughs> Bust Eye out toward Sugar Grove there, way there. So then when some of it later, whenever we could ever run, we'd do it there. And I remember Ted there told us, well, why don't you guys go on over there by the dairy bar so people don't complain about it. So we went over there and, you know, everything was fine. Nobody complained about it <laughs> for a few years anyway. <laughs> Who was the king of the hill? Was there, was there a Back car or driver who was just sort of the one seemingly won the most? Not really, I don't know. It's just, you know, if people come to go to the dairy bar if they thought they had a fast car, you just like, get them out there and have a race. Yeah, no, no, no. We would go over there and watch the drag races on uh, Friday and Saturday night. They had a, a white line that was started by the Lawson Road that they had painted across. <laughs> and then the end of the quarter mile was just past uh, Chuck Peterson's farm there. And that was a, a nightly event. I mean, there was, I don't know how else to describe it, but uh, they, there was only one policeman in Buffet at that time, uh, Willis Mattoon. And, mm -hmm. and there was no radio in his car, and he was kind of out there all by himself, so he just kind of uh, stayed out of the way. Did you, were you in those uh, drag races as well, Bobby? Oh, a couple of them, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a lot of them. <laughs> My garage was under the tree at home in the front yard, and the toolbox was a one of these sap buckets, you know, they hang on the tree. <laughs> <laughs> had some tools in there. <laughs> Pulled it up there with the chains. So it really wasn't the Wood Brothers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, I think, if I remember right, uh, Dick Ostrom ran the uh, auto wrecking place down here at, uh, on uh, Stillwater Road and uh, he had a welder. He, he let us use the welder to put some kind of roll bars in it. So all you had was a hoop behind the driver's seat. I don't think he even had to have roll bars in it. I can kind of remember trying to weld that 
the pipes together. I remember Dick Holstrom told me in a gap like that you put a bolt in there to make it stronger. So put a weld in each other. Fill in the gaps. <laughs> Luckily, we didn't go that fast in those days. To they tipped over once at State Line there, with a load of tire going into the turn and. The I can always remember that because it started going over and I didn't know what to do. I had the gas right on the floor. I get there, that roar, and I thought somebody was going to drive right through me, and it was my own motor. <laughs> <laughs> Up there, they decided, I think this was like the, the same year that State Line opened uh, to run some modified races. Again, that's what they'd been running at Skyline before. Mm -hmm. So we had a modified car. It's a couple of kids down a bus die here. The old 37 Chevy Coupe. You know, uh, the first one that uh, Bill Sperry had had a GMC truck, but the second one had an Olds 88. Uh, okay. I guess a 51 Olds 88 engine in it, I think. And we ran quite well over there. I was, you know, I'm surprised I seen the, the scrapbook there. I'd even forgot that we'd. Uh, I think they only ran like three times that year, maybe. But it was with that same car also that we went up to Cuba to the racetrack there one time. It was Ernie Schuyler and Bobby Morrison on their car. And uh, we towed it up to Cuba. I don't know what the deal was, if it was a big race or what, but we got up there and there wasn't any one of us guys that was 21 years old. They wouldn't even let us in the pits. <laughs> we, we never got to run at all. Oh my God. <laughs> First late model car we throw together was a 50 Oldsmobile and we raced that down there at uh, McKean, so I mean it was late models was the thing, either that or <coughs> modifieds, and they was kind of dying out at the, at the time around here, so that's how I happened to start right out in late models. And down to Smithport, they had, they had uh, I don't know how many years back they went, but they was running brand new cars too there. And they had kind of two different divisions that kind of separated the older ones that didn't run so good from the from the brand new cars. Well, I won a feature in the old car race there, and I I'm almost sure it paid thirteen dollars. <laughs> but when I went back the next week, I had to run with the two faster cars. So I didn't make out so well. <laughs> Was there sort of a time, Bobby, as, as you were working on your car or cars, where you just kind of said, I think I got it, that aha moment where I, I'm going to get a little bit of an edge or I have an edge? About every week, I think. We used to, <laughs> <laughs> to think that. <laughs> Until we got to the racetrack. <laughs> Race there, year one, 1956. Do you, do you recall? No, I didn't. But I was there for the first race. I didn't. I didn't race. The second year, I did. But not, well, the first year they didn't get started till mm -hmm. late in June, I think. Anyway, so that was a pretty short season, anyway. And Stadler at the time was owned by a couple of folks and Leonard Briggs. What, what's Leonard Briggs? Briggs. To Bob well, he was always against us, so this guy was, <laughs> every time we come up with some new idea, he didn't think we'd ought to be using it. Well, not every time. No, Len was a great guy, especially after, you know, he he was like your teacher in school or something, you know, you didn't really like him because he made you <laughs> stay in line. <laughs> what was the discretion where the track owner would impact the track driver? What, what could he do to... Well, what they did in the early days was State Line tried to have the rules the same as NASCAR, where you had the windshield in there, you couldn't cut the wheel wells out, you had to have your inner wheel liners in there, and uh, the windshields was the biggest thing. They fought to get rid of them because it was hard to, you know, the dirt tracks just peppered them with it. We'd drive around all over the country to the Chevy dealers and the, or you know GM dealers or car glass, try to get the windshields they'd taken out. You know, a lot of places they'd give them to you, or you'd donate a little bit to their coffee fund or something. But 
fought for the longest time to get there because you'd like if you'd go and try to go to race against the guys down in Pennsylvania or somewhere they had the wheel wells all cut out and they was running on mm -hmm. you know 12 or 13 inch tires so it made it tough to to go anywhere else and the, but of course they had you know they had a uh, good looking cars and everything up there is what they you know they was looking to put people in the stands mm -hmm. and we was looking to make it cheap for us just uh, in the early days I think just uh went off the top of their head what they thought, you know. Uh, I know quite often, like the heat races, I don't know how they come with that lineup, but if you didn't do very good in the heat, then you got a pretty good start in the semi. They, they ran semis, too. The heat was eight laps. I think the semi was 12, 12 laps, and then they kind of based off of that how you'd ran in those, in those races where you started. Later years, they went started going off the points, and they had a one time of the last three previous races or something. Mm -hmm. But then if it then if it went to, like it was a 50 lap, then they went for the last three between the two race tracks or something. That <laughs> was a it was a hard to figure it out. But they you know I, in later years, I always knew where I was going to start. The <laughs> did, did you find that your success, and it was incredible success, I don't want to say ever worked against you because obviously you continued success, but that they tried to um, make it more difficult for you to win every week? You, when, you, when you have so much success, they'd like to make it as competitive as possible. Yeah. Did you find, did you give any sense of that, Bob? Oh, yeah, but of course I would have for everybody, I guess, but. Yeah, I you know I see more through it now than I did then because all everybody's bitching about it if you're winning, you know, <laughs> so they're trying to <laughs> figure out some way of. Uh, but uh, it was it, it was the same for everyone, I guess. Uh, Scary moment, if you will, where you lost control or somebody else lost control. Uh, do you recall such an event? I never had to. I tipped over on the fence down the back stretch one time that I can remember quite vividly because I kind of dove it to the outside. It was going to throw it for the corner, and when I dove out there to throw it, Marty Rader had stuck his nose up there, and that put my nose into the fence, and I tumbled down the, there in front of the beer stand there. <laughs> That's all I ended up on my wheels, and that was a... Uh, I was lucky I never... That's the only time I was... I guess the first year in that old green car I tipped over in a third turn down there it had a flat tire going into the corner and it dumped over but I was always lucky I don't uh, I don't really know any that stands out was a some of the 150 lappers we let get away from us <laughs> it was one of Busink's cars anyway we come up to the front straight away to get the flag going and Busink's car up there didn't go and they started stacking up, and I ran right in the back end of Squirt, and somebody hit me in the back end, and I had the fan through the radiator before I got to the flag stand on a 50-lap <laughs> race one night. <laughs> Stands out. Why did you uh, decide to jump into the sportsman car when you had so much work to do on your light model? Well, Frosty wanted to, uh, he'd been helping Skip furlough. Uh, I don't know what your... Skip first started, but Gary'd been with Skip, and uh, I don't know. He just wanted to build his own, I guess. To, uh, how it happened, he he built it. Him and uh, my brother Billy had one. They they built two two that year. Yeah, last couple of years just got to be just got sick of working on it all the time. It seemed like, and uh, you know, I says I might as well get out of here while I'm still winning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not gonna hang around and. Uh, you know, that's a tough, racing is a tough deal. Everything's got to gotta work for you. It isn't like a golfer where he just goes out and does the swing and he's got control over it in the race car. You know, you might not, you might be the best driver in the world and the, you don't have a car. You only got about a 10th place car. That's what you're going to end up, you know. <laughs> I spent 20 years every Saturday night at the at the Speedway up there, you know. 
course, the first year I had Oldsmobile. In the second year, 58, I had Oldsmobile. And, and I always had Chevrolets till I built the Javelin for uh, Hagelin Auto Sales. And Jim Raid that went on to be community Chrysler, he was a sales manager at uh, Hagelin Rambler up there, and I had worked there some too, so he kind of wanted to get a, a Rambler going there for a race car. I think that was a year before maybe they had a, I forget what they called the Rambler, it was a full-sized car there, more like a Chevelle or something. But Rebel? One yeah. The I Rebel. Think Rebel. But 68 was the first year they had a, the Javelin come out. It was like the, the fit in the Camaro category. And also they came out with a, they had a little sports car uh, version of it that looked just like the Javelin, but a two or a single seater, I guess. And they came in that year with a 390 cubic inch engine came out so it was able to when we built the Javelin we put a 390 cubic inch engine in it but there's there's quite a story to that <laughs> car too because uh, there was a unit body construction and uh, and the American Motors where the Camaros had a front frame stub in the you know, went back under the the driver's seat, and they got a they got a brand new body from uh, well, no Detroit or wherever it was with a. I think that one came in a crate, mm. and it was it just had the trunk on it, and uh, might have been the doors, but there was no front. I know, and they let us put a frame under it, but. At the time, Ford was running uh, Ford Fairlane, I think, in NASCAR, and NASCAR had a deal where they, that Fairlane, they took the floor all out of it and they used the front frame out of the older Galaxy in there. And uh, Leonard kind of thought that's what we ought to do, but that Galaxy where the frame rails come out was much wider than the, than the, than the Rambler that was a lot narrower body than that Port Fairlane. So, so moral of the story ended up with a, a Chevelle chassis under there. I went down at the time, uh, Chuck Piazza was always already down in Florida, or I mean in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Bud Moore was running factory Fords, mm -hmm. so the guy Chuck worked for, Elmo Henderson, took me down there to there and I seen how they was doing that, but of course they'd taken the whole floor pan out of the car and, and put this frame section in back to where your rear uprights come down on your roll cage and stuff. And they had a brand new floor panel to put back in there, you know. Then that old javelin cut the whole bottom of it out and I believe that was 68 Chevelle frame on the front of it from where the roll bars came forward. But that was a uh, the, I can't remember if the, I know when I went to put the motor in, the, the motor went fit in that for the cross member was back kind of too far there for the, for the engine to fit down in there. And they, and then the engine too, we didn't get a complete engine. They bought a short block out of the, the, you know, the parts department and the oil pan and the cylinder heads and the bolts and everything was piece by piece. So we ended up, after we finally got the frame figured out how to get that, you must have been in on that when he was building that javelin there. So I had to make an oil pan to fit the, fit the engine down in there. And then of course, headers wasn't, a, <laughs> you know, they hadn't, they wasn't making a lot of speed equipment for the mm -hmm. American mm -hmm. Motors. Had to build exhausts, and they was a puzzle. They was a puzzle <laughs> again. And uh, I guess that thing was a the the crankshaft was a the crank throws on the crankshaft was a little bit bigger around than they was on the uh, 
Rambert had a 343 cubic inch V8. So, so this was all new, this thing. You couldn't even buy any bearings for it unless you got them from American Motors. First hurdle we had was the, the pistons had eyebrows cut in them. They were flat top pistons, but the American Motors had a hydraulic cam that they had come out with for that 343 engine. And I took the lifters apart, took the pistons in there and turned them over and put some little washers on the top to, to make them solid so they, they couldn't pump up anymore. And moral of the story anyway, the, the exhaust valves was contacting the pistons. I don't know if we ran it the second night or something, but then it blew up, broke a valve off. I remember Gary took the valves, the exhaust valves, and my gosh, it was about a quarter of an inch thick, almost seemed like on the top. He took them to work and cut the top tops of them off, so there was a lot thinner valve. But the the Rambler engine had a, a each stud had a rocker arm like Ford and Chevrolet, but they wasn't adjustable on the, on a Rambler. He just tightened them down because it was a hydraulic. Lifter, you know, he bottomed them out. I forget if I used Chevy nuts there or something, but the, the valve deal too, you couldn't use it. Chevrolet had a lightweight valve in their high performance engines, undercut, swirl polish thing, but the, the Rambler had a valve that was about 3 8 diameter on the valve stem, so it could have been, you know, if it made bushings. So I don't know, it was quite a Quite a rigmarole to, to get that thing on a racetrack, I know that. Yeah. Berglund, I think. Uh, Jimmy Fardink and uh, Tony White built the car, and I just drove it. Mm -hmm. uh, Ed Schultz and Don Gage had gone together. They also got a new body for that. Paul Hellman went to uh, somewhere, and that one came, I think, with a hood and fenders, and there was no paint on them, it was bare. Yeah, just a greasy bare metal. Fill on that thing. Mm -hmm. But the trouble, biggest trouble we had with that car, it was so late in the year before we got started at it, and uh, he was, uh, Paul's, Paul had a car there with a Hemi, and they bought that engine from James Hilton down in uh, North Carolina there, and he was supposedly going to build us one. Well, got to the point, I had to have an engine. So, we went down there, Jim and I both went down. I rode down there with him. I don't know. He ended up, he had one there that was a practice motor or something. He said it was all ready to go. But I could never, I could never wait to work. My gosh, that thing had, didn't take ports on it that big around. <laughs> Just didn't have no low RPM power to it. It either, when it come to life, it was, wow. You know, I had trouble with it starting the race. You then had to shift it. Get, to start and second and shift it to high, you know. And I know we started that thing up and it rumbled so the window spurner fell out of the garage. We was, <laughs> then after I had my own car for a couple of years, I was ready to quit completely. And Plymouth, when we built that, Frosty built a coupe and Billy built a sportsman. Uh, Billy had run sportsman before that in a six cylinder, but I believe that was a First year for the V8 engines, and Gary built a, a coupe there. 73, I like the way that that Camaro handled, too, that, that newer style Camaro frame under the front. I thought was that it all over the, the old uh, uh, Chevelle type. So, so we built a chassis. So we used the front frame, and the rear springs was Camaro, and they was mounted Tried to mount the rear springs in the same location, you know, as as a, it was on the Chevelle. The Chevelle was a unit body, the back end, but the side rails out of the frame, I believe, was out of a. Well, I know what they was. They was a, come down, it went out like a Chevelle down the sides, and then it come back in, and the rear rails was out of a '57 Chevy, I believe. Finally, State Line decided he was going to let them tend them over in the back and. <laughs> The whole thing, so heck, we've already got a frame. Why build another one? You know. Mm -hmm. So we, then, like, I don't know how many years I ran.
you, you just gave us a whole catalog of all your cars, Bobby. What was the car that you said, gee, if I could bring it back today, that would be the one I would bring? Oh, the race up there, man? Yeah, yeah. Well, just the one that you really felt the most comfortable with. That last Camaro we had in Rouen. The last couple years. The first year we ran that car is uh, when you could, you know, you didn't have to have windshields in anymore for the longest time I had windshields. We didn't win all that. We won our share. And some of the things, I shouldn't say this because uh, maybe I'd be stepping on somebody's feet, but some of the years, like the last year, I don't think Jimmy Scott was still running, was he? Mm -hmm. Or Swerve was gone. Mm -hmm. it eliminated some of the competition, didn't hurt nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's many of them to beat. <laughs> Well, when they first started, of course, Emery, Emery was a, a big runner, and he had that fuel-injected Chevy. I think it kept burning pistons, mm -hmm. but, you know, if, if the car held up, Emery was, would win. And Dean Layfield was always a great competitor. Squirt Johns, Bobby Schneiders. Uh, I used to go up there and fool around, and he had a big old... I can't remember what year it was, Osmo, it was a full-size Osmobile. Mm -hmm. And he'd get up there and try to get that thing around them corners, and he'd come down the straightaway, about halfway down the straightaway, he'd throw that thing into a slide just to, to keep it inside the track. Dean Layfield, I, Dean used to like to turn the car sideways about at the flag stand and, <laughs> and went around there, and I thought that was the fast way around. You know? So I kind of idolized him in the early days. So he was kind of a showman. I know when he was leading, he was looking in the stands some of the time when he was sliding around the corner. Exhaust stuck right up through the hood. <laughs> the way he's there. They called it Tempest in the Teapot or something. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that was Dean. Uh, what does the Squirt Johns mean to a Bobby Schnarrs? Well, Squirt was the guy, you know, Dean there, he, he ran really good for like the first year or so. I'm not, I'm not sure when he got killed, but well, in 58, he, uh, he built a new, new Chevy to take to Daytona, and that 58 Chevy never really was not that great of a race car, so after that, Squirt was the guy to beat. He, Squirt had uh, an ability to miss the wrecks, too. And I seemed to find them. I, <laughs> I, I could go like hell, but I'd run into somebody. No, no. Oh, Bobby was, yeah, he was great. He, 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 I always thought he was the smartest racer there ever was, because he, he, he run, run onto one kind of a chassis, and on any car he built himself, from then on, it was the same car, mm -hmm. and he just. He stuck with that. Me, I built a Dodge and a Hudson and a, uh, you know, and 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 uh, you know, tours and bar Dodges and and, and coil spring Chevys. I even run a, a, a uh, this Chevelle here had coil springs all the way around and stuff, and and I'm always changing, thinking this is better and stuff. But Bobby was the smartest man because he he run the same thing. When he ran a Rambler, it had a Chevelle chassis on there. The, the Dodge he run for for the dealer up there. Now that was a Dodge, but that, but the, any car he built himself, why, it had that Chevelle um, workings chassis, underneath yeah. it, and I thought it was a smart thing to do. He he, he was ready without experimenting, you know. But Squirt, yeah, Squirt was great. Uh. I think he learned me how to get around state line. The squirt always slowed down a little bit coming into the corner, I figured out finally instead of, see, I wanted to be like Dean Layfield. I'd throw it <laughs> up toward the fence and throw it into the corner. And of course, then when the wreck was, I was already coming in flat out going sideways. There wasn't much I could do. You know? And squirt style was a lot better for, uh, for missing the the Rex. What was his style? He just was smooth about it. He'd, he'd come up and you know he'd slow down. He, he liked to run the inside and he just made sure he got traction coming off the corner and you know he just uh, 
he did never got excited, I guess. He's very smooth about the thing. We tried, you know, a lot of years for it before we could beat him. <laughs> But he, he raced the same car for 20 years. <laughs> what do you mean by that, Tom? Same chassis, same setup, pretty much. So he didn't have to work. He already broke everything and replaced it with something heavier. So that he didn't have to experiment much. A driver that, that you tried to, um, that you had some sense of, I don't want to say awe, but you respect it more than others. Yeah, you always know, gave Bobby rum because he was going to, he was going to pass you anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about Tom Dill. The biggest thing I can remember about Tom was he was a little wild, but I didn't, I never had a, any problem with Tom Dill myself. I, I used him to my advantage, really, if I was behind him. I, Tom could clear the way out. <laughs> to get up through there, and uh, he said, oh, I'd, I'd, I'd try to follow him. So, uh, no, I, I always got along good with Tom. Matter of fact, one time, I, I forget what I did, I, I bumped him, put him in a fence, and he wasn't too happy about it. I think it was at State Line there one time. I didn't do it intentionally, but, but he, I don't know, he never got even with me for it, so I guess it was okay. Yeah, we can catch it. <laughs> oh, yeah, he could. I'm going to tell you a story about Ronnie, too, and uh, cause Ronnie started his, his racing career over there at, uh, at uh, Rollable, I think. I don't know if he had told you this, but he told me one time, well, Ronnie was dating Frank's daughter, I guess, is how he got, to, got Frank and him together to build that race car. And uh, so he went over there, and, and uh, Ronnie said, I don't know, he went out and he come in and uh, I don't know what he got, or fifth or something, he says, Frank told him, he says, well, my God, I thought you was going to floor the God dang thing when we got up here. He said, I know he's just going to go out there and pussyfoot around like that. <laughs> so Ronnie said the next time he went out, he figured he was going to show him he held it on the floor until he ended up the, up the bank on the back stretch or <laughs> something, he said. So. <laughs> <laughs> so Frank must have been a little bit of a prod to, yeah, yeah. to get him going. Oh, he had a lot better reputation than I did. <laughs> Ronnie used to win everything to heat the semi in the feature. He was disappointed if he didn't uh, if he didn't get all three of them in a night. Who's your big competition? Well, Bobby. Mm -hmm. Square. I mean, you could count on him being in the front. Uh, he was he was an original. Uh, yeah. What was he like? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Jones a great guy. But guys, really, it's amazing that he's lived this long. <laughs> <laughs> he was really crazy. Would stand out in my mind as he was riding with Johnny Whitehead one day. Johnny was showing Jug how I, I threw it into the corner that's coming up from Frewsburg toward Stillwater there, and Johnny cut it one way and he threw it her the other way, showed Jug how I kicked it into the corner, and Jug's door flew open and he <laughs> fell out and <laughs> slid up the road on the blacktop for a ways. <laughs> it was more fun for me to race than it was to make money. Camaraderie after the race, there'd be two or three fires in, in the Pits, you know, and people having a few beers and and talking with each other, and, and that's the way it was. And they don't get that anymore, you know. Were there quick trigger, some of the quick trigger yeah, guys? Yeah, I was one of them, too. <laughs> <laughs> Bobby Schnars. Bobby, good guy, yeah. He won a lot of races. And the, one of his partners uh, had a machine shop that built the motors, and they run, mm -hmm. and Bobby run. He won a lot of races. Bobby, hell of a driver. 
I, I think Bobby probably drew a lot of fans because he, he's a winner. It's just, I don't know, it just seemed like we were at odds, not all of us maybe, but it was, you know, it was just, we were at odds somehow, and I, I introduced his car owner to uh, my, my niece by marriage, uh, Janie Russell there, so I, I introduced him to Frosty, and uh, they ended up getting married. Bobby would, he was a hell of a driver. I mean, he he could get a car around a race. And, it, and they, back then, there was nowhere near the technology there is today. I mean, the technology was, was in your head, you know. It wasn't, I mean, they did things that, you know, killed one spark plug so there's only running on seven so they get traction and all kinds of stuff like that you know really? I mean he was <laughs> they were good at that yeah. and uh, so he would he, he would definitely he was I, I, I I'm he was one of I won't say he was the biggest fan drawer was but he was right up the top because he was he was good there wasn't any better I always admired Blackie there <laughs> His driving ability, and Johnny Whitehead, of course, kind of palled around with Johnny there through the years. Greg, the funniest thing that ever I ever saw that happened at State Line Speedway was, what would Johnny Whitehead say? <laughs> or the craziest thing or something? No. I mean, one thing we used to do, Bobby Snars and I, we'd start at the tail end of the heat race, and we'd, we'd both run hard for a few laps, but if you couldn't get off in the money, then we'd put on a little race to the back of the pack. And see who could come in last, and then he'd, he'd get to start ahead in the, oh, really? in the semifinal. And that guy down to Snars. He'd always wind up. We raced, we'd be back and forth. Yeah. And one night I said, I'm going to finish behind you. <laughs> that son of a gun pulled in the pits. <laughs> the last lap, he still finished behind me. <laughs> Bobby? Everybody used to tease me that I used to get beat by the farmer kid out of Busti. Yeah. <laughs> he had a friend that used to come to the garage all the time. He's always teasing me. You let that little farm boy beat you again, huh? Bobby was terrific. He had some good help around him. They had good cars. You know, Frosty was there, and, um, and Whitey, I think, was there at the time. They built some good stuff, and he knew how to drive it. And I think he was ahead of us a little bit on... Um, on clutches and stuff. Mm -hmm. I've never been able to prove that. I'm going to ask Bobby someday. But I had heard he had the first clutch that, um, that what, they, what they call them. Triple disc. Triple disc. I think he was the first one to come out with that that nobody knew about. <laughs> and I think it was Chuck Piaz that used to pump that information up to him because Chuck was down south working for the race boys down there. And the, the last year that I ran, I got a triple disc clutch. They'd been out for a couple of years, I guess, but nobody ran them up here. I, I know Leonard wouldn't have let me have one if he knew I had it. Because <laughs> <laughs> we had a handicap start deal up there where you started last all the time. And if you was winning, you didn't get to use any new stuff that came out either. We kind of liked, uh, I don't know if you'd call it even the playing field, but there was different rules for different folks. Yeah. Really? <laughs> I felt so anyway. <laughs> What's Bobby Schneider's mean to Jim Palaro? No, he's just a buddy. Yeah. Good friend. Good friend, always was. Him and his brother, his little brother. Billy, was it? Was it Billy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Billy and Bobby. I used to go out there all the time and stand there, stand inside, you know. When he was building that Plymouth, he wrote and drove for uh, Jim, Jim, Jim no, Raid. Jim Raid. He was building a Plymouth up the Hunt Rotor. Yeah. 
And you used to have that little gas there. There was an old gas station at one time. Yeah, Baker Street. Baker yeah, Street. on Baker, yeah, Street. Baker Street. And I used to go up there and watch him. Bobby, he was something. That son of a gun, he'd stand there and crawl inside. He welded every piece of that goddamn car. He by himself, and he gas welded it. There was no arc welds back in them days, I guess. If there was, I didn't, I didn't know what it was. What made him so successful? <sighs> I wish the hell I could tell you. Or you would have done it. Oh, yes. <laughs> The guy was very clever. Number one, he he was in the racing a lot deeper than a lot of us around here, and what by that he knew about more about little tricks mm -hmm. than we've ever even heard of. Now he was he came out with the first god darn miniature disc clutch, you know, that was it where he got all his acceleration and and get up and go. He, and he had the power anytime he wanted it because you know he was so, had such response. And, uh, but he was something else. Oh, Bobby, yeah, he's, he won a lot of races. But you know, <laughs> I don't know if anybody else has ever told you this. He put you in a position where you had to let him pass because if he was trying to pass you, I mean, he would throw, you would be out here like this, he'd throw that thing and you'd see him coming. If you stayed there, you you were gonna wreck. So you just get on the gas, on the brake, and let him go. Okay, like, a slide, <laughs> like a slide job. Yeah, thing? and I mean, and he wasn't cleared. I mean, you knew he was gonna hit you, you know. And I don't know if he would have hit you or not, but I always just jumped on the brake and let him go. And I don't know if everybody else did that or not, but I thought, you know, if I could do that with everybody, I could win a lot of races too. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely he was good. I mean, he knew how to set up a car. He had some fast cars. Uh, if it wasn't for Bobby Snars, I'd have been a hero. You know, I mean, I followed that man <laughs> around the racetrack all my life. <laughs> and he was so hard to beat. He worked hard on his race car. He was one of the first people that really spent time in... Uh, and it's true even today. You either got to spend a lot of time, or you got to spend a lot of money. And uh, and it's awful hard to beat the time. And uh, and Bobby knew what to do. And you know he never had a real job, so he had to race hard. <laughs> you know, if, if he wanted to buy groceries, he had to race hard. So I think that incentive helped a lot too. But now, like Bobby Snars, you know, Bobby was always. Uh, he was a smooth race car driver, a very good race car driver. He had a lot of fans. Uh, but Bobby moved you up a racetrack, and he'd do it so easy and so gentle that nobody ever seen it, especially <laughs> the people on the racetrack. They could never see that, you know. You'd be leading a race, and Bobby would just, just coming up off the corner, he'd just, just loosen you up enough to get to here. And once he got to there, he had you beat. You know, because then when he got to the next corner, he was here and and he was gone. You know, and uh, uh, he was an absolute genius at just loosening you up a little bit. Now, are you saying he he actually made contact? Oh with you, yeah. Or he just got into a position no, where he, you had to move. No, he he he'd make contact and, okay. and break. You'd be coming up off the corner, hooked up. Yeah. And he'd just break your traction for just an instant. You know and then scoop beside you, and, uh, and nobody ever seen that. You know, I know we went to State Line uh, one time in 68, uh, and we picked our pay up for the, follow for the previous Saturday night, and I got paid for last place, and I had uh, ran second. Of course, I complained, Leonard Briggs again, and uh, what happened? He said, well, you passed inside the tires. I said, he said, when you pass Bobby Snars for the lead, you passed inside the tires. And they had a group of, a yeah, yeah, yeah. ring of tires around him. Yeah, when that was forbidden land. I talked to Leonard and I said, uh, I admit I got inside the tires to pass Bobby. Bobby, I was inside the tires when Bobby passed me. <laughs> <laughs> Which part of that didn't you understand, you know? <laughs> And the following lap, Bobby, Bobby just put all four tires inside the tire <laughs> and passed me and won the race. And they paid him for first, you know. So they gave me my money and 
And uh, that was supposed to end passing inside the tires, but before that night was over, we passed inside the tires again, you know. Um, who are the guys you were looking up to? Bobby Snars, you know. My buddy, my buddy always told me, just watch what Snars does, you know. Do what he does, that's all you got to do. That, that sounds easy. That's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which it wasn't. <laughs> Looked like everybody left home and up and let him go, you know. <laughs> <laughs> There's that Bobby Snares that couldn't drive a wheelbar, but he won every hundred or fifty lap race there was. <laughs> <laughs> why was that? You know why Bobby won them? No. Bobby Snares drove as fast. I mean, and lap one, the same at a lap. It was a hundred lap race. He drove just as hard at a hundred laps. The hundred lap races he did at the first race that's gone. He was a very strong. I mean, he just drove hard. He drove just hard every lap that way. Almost unbeatable. He could really, he owned State Line Speedway. I never really held a grudge against anybody at all. I, some guys I'd rather race with and, than others, but uh, Schnars, he was, as good as he was, he could have been rough, but he wasn't rough. He was, he's just a good driver. He took advantage of the openings and, mm -hmm. and really moved on. Bobby Snarr, driving 56 holes when we used to race each other. We couldn't keep up with the others because the others had bigger engines. But we had a lot of fun trying. But then Bobby got great. Yeah. He was really great. You and Bobby were known as innovators. Yeah, we, what were some of the things that you feel you brought to the to the sport that maybe other guys didn't have? Well, I think we started setting our engines way back, and we we did a lot of things that was hard to find. When I first started working with Bob, everybody was running big block Chevys, and uh, we run a small block. We were the first ones. To, well, I won't say the first ones, but we run a small block, and uh, we just destroyed them. We won. Uh, we had the Camaro that we won the first first five races of the year with a, and we run for uh, Jim Raid with a Hemi. That was a, a thing of beauty. In the sense that you won so much, was there envy? Same no, time, lighten up. No, there was guys that didn't didn't care for it. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. But the, most people, once they got once the race was over with there, I mean, Bob was never a dirty driver. Yeah. He never done anything. If you if you're a dirty driver and you win a lot, then you're going to have problems. But he was never a dirty driver. Did did Bobby? Did you and Bobby also work on the sportsman's cars as well? That was Gary uh, <laughs> Fos, Gary Fosberg. Okay. You know, Gary was he was good. They, in fact, the one year that we won the. Late model championship and the sportsman championship the same year. I knew Bobby. Yeah. What, what did he mean to you? Does he? I uh, was uh, much more professional at it than I certainly was. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he uh, him and his owner approached it at a much more serious mm -hmm. uh, rail. And I, you know, I did, I had to admire him. Who would be the person you'd least want to have coming up behind you? Bobby Snarris. Bobby Snarris? Absolutely. The reason being? He'll spin you out. <laughs> and then he'll straighten you out as he goes by. That was his favorite trick. Then you think, gee, it was nice of him. I was spinning out and, and he straightened me out. Yeah. What a good guy. <laughs> and they were by you. He was good. He was a hell of a driver. Yeah. Can't take that away from him. Was he sort of the best during your time period, Johnny? He had everything together, yes. He, he was definitely an excellent driver, but they also had a lot of other things. I mean, they knew what that car was going to do from one heat to the next. Mm -hmm. I went up there with the same car, with one car, one set of tires, and 
I never changed the tire unless it was flat. You know, I didn't approach the racing with uh, the same degree of uh, professionalism that they did. He got better after we started racing. Yeah, got a whole lot better. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, he got harder and harder to beat. He never quit. Yeah. It's like a bulldog. Mm -hmm. You know, they get a hold of your pant leg, they won't quit. <laughs> he just never quit. Yeah. He, he would know. This is Bobby? He wouldn't even know. Hey, Bobby. 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 Bobby just <clears throat> never quit. I always felt bad about that. The last race that I drove for our late mile, mm -hmm. the last race at State Line, I had it won, and I got into three a little deeper than I sh maybe should have, and I had rear axle hop, which we never did. I mean, it was not, I won't say never, but when we had it, we fixed it. And Bobby slid right up inside of me and went on one race. So I lost the last race that I ever drove our Ford late model mm -hmm. to Bobby. You're at the last lap, and you're going into turns three and four. Who? among your drivers would be the guy you'd least likely want to have on your rear going into turns three and four I don't know I don't remember ever having one on there <laughs> Bobby Snars, that's the, he's the king like he's like Richard Petty Oh, I always watch Bob. It was mainly taking the dents out. <laughs> Is that right? Yep. Yeah. I did all the body work and stuff like that mainly. Busy, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, that, was that hard to watch a race? You had said you're the dent guy, and you're... no, I just take him out and he'd put them in. <laughs> well, that's the point. <laughs> <laughs> and we we just go through the procedure every week, so, you know. Was there a lot of that kind of? Pushing and shoving, I mean, was that just kind of the normal racing? Yeah, you know, I mean, you had to, if you were going to get from 20th or 19th to the front and 25 laps, you had to move a few of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we always had a little competition that uh, Jay Plyler's, Russ Thompson would come over, and of course he'd stand there to talk, and he'd be punching his finger into the tires to see what kind of combination you're going to run and we got pretty smart we you know the 806 and the 802s and 808 I guess it was 806 and 808 we paint different colors on them and pretty quick we were putting pink and <laughs> just anything throw them off if we could got to be a big joke one year I remember he won 11 features and Virtually unbeatable. The only time he didn't win, I guess, is when the throttle stuck, mm -hmm. and he kind of he had to spin it out just to keep from smashing into the wall. And you know, we did some aftermarket changes after that, so it wouldn't stick again. But that was about that was about it. It was uh, quite a pleasure to watch. It was, you know, talking with Frosty on, you know, what. You know what we always needed to do, and Bob was always impressed with what we always did. It was, and we were impressed with the way he took care of the equipment and came up through the pack. I always looked up to him, and any time I could get around his place, I was, I was in my glory. You know, I remember, uh, probably in the '60s, late '60s, Esso came out with Boodle tires. And maybe you, this has been on there before. No, and uh, what butyl tires were were soft tires, you know. Mm -hmm. And back then you didn't, you just bought what tires, street tires. And these SO tires, Bob found out someplace about them that they were a softer compound, get more bite, they'd wear out faster. But and we would go there again, you know, when we were out on our missions in the winter, all winter long, we'd get stocked up on them. You go to every SO station in the, this part of the state and down into Pennsylvania. And uh, pretty quick, I don't know, they, they weren't selling them because they wore out so much, so they quit making them. Uh, back then, there was no such thing as 
Hoosier tires or American Racer tires. They were, you know, yeah. not around here. There might have been in Indianapolis or something like that, but uh, it was all street tires. Yeah, yeah. And the guy that could get the uh, S.O. Butyl tires, would, that would help you out quite yeah, yeah. a bit. He wasn't one to uh, brag about it or, you know, he kept stuff like that to himself. I mean, he, he earned his living racing, and he'd pull that car in on uh, Monday morning, and it would be on jack stands, and we'd, uh, if I wasn't working, and we'd be uh, up there helping him and looking around it, and he'd, he'd go over that car from you know, one end to the other. He, he tried to keep his pit crew in line, and sometimes <laughs> it didn't work. Is that? Oh, yeah. And, uh, was there a guy in your group who was sort of the muscle? Well, Big Jim Morrison early in the years, uh, and then Cale Groves in the later years, uh, you couldn't keep him under control, you know. He would, uh, the slightest, if you ever said something about this other driver, I think he would, he just bum me for some reason. Cale would uh, be right down there shaking the guy by the neck, you know, and, and uh, and that's, I'm not kidding about that. I mean, that was, and, and Bob would just stand back there and shake his head. We're always searching for sponsors. And, uh, you know, of course, the surf club was one of the better ones because uh, when you weren't racing, you could uh, go up there and uh, talk about racing. That's right. you know? And, and uh, Junie Shank treated us pretty good up there. Yeah. yeah. Right, he was my uh, big brother at that time, and so I always looked up to him uh, at, at, at that point. Uh, well, uh, some would say he was a bad influence, but uh, <laughs> I, I learned an awful lot, you know, by, by tagging along on, on a lot of that. Realize how much time was spent, especially with Bob and Frosty. I mean, they put they put hours and hours and hours into into the race car you know, to keep it uh, really sharp and ready to go. What was it that made your brother special <laughs> as a driver? I don't really know. He was just very, very good. That's the only way I can... Uh, he's just a, a natural. Uh, he was just a natural. Uh, there was no other way to describe it. Followed uh, Marv Levy. He was a coach of the Buffalo mm -hmm. Bills. He had that one-liner, uh, where would you rather be than right here, right now? Yes. And that's the way I think I felt when we got to State Line Area Erie Speedway. That was a... It was, I don't know. It was just a, a magical place. I don't know if there's any way, other way to describe it. Uh, his role there? I mean, what, what, what did he do for Bobby? We owned the car did you? and uh, he was the designer, the mechanic uh, of finding innovative ways to make it go faster and uh, he was a tool and die maker so it came naturally to him to find a way to uh, jazz it up still being within the rules, but maybe something that the other guys didn't have. So he was ahead of the game and... Uh, uh, yeah, and he kept those secrets to himself. He always would have uh, a little index card in which he uh, wrote down all the dimensions and everything that he had, where he had them. Um, over the years I located, and I don't know where they are now, but he used to keep a record uh, every night of how the track was, what the tire pressure was, everything that there was, everything was recorded, everything was um, checked and rechecked, and if the track changed, the tires changed. Um, he, he saw it, I think, more as a challenge to his brain mm -hmm. um, as much as the fun of, of just going out and watching it go around the track. So at the time that, that uh, they were racing, they had a beer sponsor. And the beer sponsor was not money, it was cases of beer. Made it a very popular spot. <laughs> oh, well the highlight is that when uh, Bob was down and out, you'd know pretty sure that he was going to race like uh, the wind and come around and it was exciting to watch him come from behind and win.
uh, I'm I'm proud of it because uh, in my short span, just watching Bob out there is it was just an art the way he could drive and adapt to a different race condition or competition. If somebody was fast and he could uh, he could drive them hard in the turn and keep doing it for three or four laps, and all of a sudden he'd fool them and cut her short and cut down on the inside and win the feature. And it's just un unbelievable talent when Do some, of that inside some, out some people it. just don't have that. And he had it the whole time I watched him. Uh, I think Bob was very, very good at taking the court, taking care of equipment. I mean, I can't remember you tearing anything up uh, too dramatically there. Yeah, early on, you know, we knew we had to fix it. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that was a big incentive too. I mean, no, I mean, yeah. as far as that, you're the master of keeping all the tires on and and being there at the end of the race. I think we all thrived after Bob, too, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, like I said before, not not a father figure, but I think everybody looked up to him. Mm -hmm. And we learned a lot from him, too. And uh, he tried to keep us straight. Well, it didn't work very much. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think anybody that ever had anything to do with Bob is very proud uh, over the years that... Uh, of course, the last punk in a snowmobile crash. What was that, about seven, 1974, I think? Punk was one of the main ones, and if we are ever, all of us think about Charlie uh, Van Gilder, that if he was still alive, I think he'd still be in it like I am. Mm -hmm. I, I think somehow uh, he'd still be in it. He was a racer's racer. You know, he he learned early that he wasn't much of a driver on the track, uh, but what a guy, you know. And he he borrow till he couldn't borrow anymore to go racing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Jim Morrison, uh, he was in there with early years with Bob, and yeah. like you said, he was kind of an enforcer, and they knew they didn't want to mess around with Big Jim or Bob, <laughs> and. Uh, he passed away early, and uh, Whitey was Whitey. It's uh, uh, just hard to believe everything. And he was, all these guys were racers, you know, they, that's what they lived for. Mm -hmm. and, and along with Bob, uh, a lot of us, you know, kind of moved on to other things, but uh, they're Whitey. I don't know, I, I think he'd still be in it. Uh, he wanted to race right up till the end. Yeah. Gary Fosberg, there's the other one. That, <laughs> Yeah, he enjoyed it so much, and and, and enjoyed helping out any way he could for uh, the race car or anything that uh, he could do. Uh, and I just uh, we all miss him so bad. He isn't going to say it, but uh, his legacy is. If uh, I think if they had a uh, Hall of Fame for Busta, he'd be at the top of the list. Bobby, we're, we've been here and enjoying so much their conversation. What's the question you're waiting for to be asked that we haven't asked yet? You're saying, all right, I wonder, I, I, I wonder if they're ever going to get around to this. Well, I just wonder if you ask how many beers we drank. Up there. <laughs> 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 yeah, that wasn't on our list. I sure as hell would like to know the answer. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you I don't know the answer. They turned off the camera, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Bobby Schnars. <laughs>
you know, I ran on the road. I didn't do all of my racing at the Speedway either <laughs> in the early years. <laughs> if it wasn't for Bobby Snars, I'd have been a hero. You know, I mean, I followed that man around the racetrack all my life. <laughs> and he was so hard to beat. I, uh, I didn't finish last. I passed the one guy to get out of last place. <laughs> <laughs> Was there sort of a time, Bobby, as, as you were working on your car or cars, where you just kind of said, uh, I think I got it, that aha moment where uh, I'm going to get a little bit of an edge or I have an edge? About every week, I think. We used to think that. There was that Bobby Schneider that couldn't drive a wheelbar, but he won every 100 or 50 lap race there was. <laughs> was. Were there quick trigger, some of the tr quick trigger yeah, guys? Yeah, but I was one of them, too. <laughs> Among your drivers would be the guy you'd least likely want to have on your rear. Going into turns three and four. I don't remember ever having one on there. <laughs> Bobby Snyder, that's he's the king. Like he's like Richard Petty. He was good. There wasn't any better. Nice call in by 